What's up, everybody? I forgot to do my sound cue. Yeah, you there know it what? Is. It sounds hey, a little something. There like, hey. it is. Hey, it's like, it, you know, it, it, we were moving so fast that we were going faster than the sound barrier. It, it fi- the sound effect finally just caught up with us. I think that's yeah. I think that's what happened. Yes. What's up, that's everybody? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Welcome to Keith and Mike Watch Deep Space Nine. Uh, it is a an early Saturday morning, so my brain will be waking up as we go. Despite the fact I've been up for two hours, why am I so sleepy? I can't tell but, you. But uh, nonetheless, we are talking today about Deep Space Nine, Season One, Episode Seventeen, Dramatis Persona. So it is. Uh, it's much like gonna that. be much like that. It, it is much like that. It is gonna be something. Uh, but we are excited to talk about it. We are here, uh, you know, uh, doing our normal thing. And before we get into the episode, we have to do our usual uh, begging for sub- subscribers and uh, and Patreon and such. And I have to say, we are now getting very close to when we drop Star Trek The Wrath of Neener at 500 subscribers. I feel like uh, I'm, it's more like unleashing uh, Star Trek The Wrath of Neener yeah. rather than releasing it. because Or like releasing into the wild that's going to go and, you know... Take down towns. It's, it's My brain is like, not working. It's sort of yet. like when they uh, re-released Morbius in theaters because they were like, "Oh, this time, people will come see it." Yeah, some something like that. It's or I, I think it's more like when uh, when you're contractually obligated not to release it straight to DVD. Mm. So you put it out like I don't know what's when's the dead time? It's like February. Put it out in February in, in three theaters and hope nobody notices. I think that's kind of where we're going. Oh, we for know what's going to happen. We know we notice. Well, do you want to know who already has access to the cinematic achievement Star Trek The Wrath of Neener? These it's people? It's our patrons. Yes, yeah. on patreon.com slash K and M. Spell out that and. And you can support the show financially, be a producer on this show, on Star Trek toys and all of our other stuff, and get bonus content that Mike's going to tell you about. Yeah, listen, I just watched this episode of Deep Space Nine last night uh, as I was mm-hmm. getting so much work done. Oh, good God. This was a week. and uh, But you guys were along for the ride, including Brian Kaufman, Casey Clark, Cloud Lover 69, Jorge Navoa, The Mysterious Anne, Alan Zimmerman, CRM Productions, Charles, Charles Babbage. They also get first looks at some special content we drop on the here and now that's going to get more consistent i promise the summertime we're going to figure we're going to do a strategic meeting and figure some stuff out for the fall uh mm. but you guys are getting in at the ground level this is like pbs um and and at some point the patreon feed of this uh, very podcast will not have this ad portion cuz you've already paid for it but uh we haven't figured that out yet so we appreciate you no. guys just being producers of the show it means a lot it helps us a lot believe it or not uh, even at this early phase. So uh, thanks and again. Check us out. Indeed. And 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 like PBS, you're going to have guys talking too close to the microphone. But unlike PBS, you will not get a tote bag. So, My favorite uh, thing about PBS now, in the here and now, is that they still think that like for $200, you're not just supporting the channel. They think you want 17 CDs and 18 DVDs of a Michael Buble concert. And I'm like, ah, I'm good. Well, also, they're still sending out CDs and DVDs. But, hey, you know, there are people out there who want them. Like, you know, your mom probably like, yes, send me that DVD of Michael Buble. Mike, yeah, yeah. I mean, don't I'm, I mean, no, no shade on Buble. Love Buble. I'm just saying I don't want 18 DVDs of one concert. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I don't think it's 18 DVDs of the same concert. Like, 18 what, what's copies? What's on the other DVDs? I'm assuming other concerts or bonus material. I don't think they're like, oh, man, we've got a warehouse. I, somebody <laughs> added it a zero, and we ordered 10 million copies of the Michael Buble. How do we get these out I'm of our house? I'm just telling you the logistics don't work for me. Anyway, Keith, 12 let's talk CDs about the for a penny, but they're all the same Trek. CD. Come on. Yes. Star Trek. Trek, 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 <laughs> Trek. Yourself on track. Okay? Trek, Trek. We need to get on to our Star Trek, indeed. All right, so we're talking about Dramatis Persona, Deep Space Nine, Season 1, Episode 17, which aired on Sunday, May 30th, the year 1993. Uh, we were still listening to the wild hit 
that's the way love goes. Uh, Janet Jackson, Mike, did did you happen to go and listen to it at all during this week? That's the way. That's the way. That's the way love goes. <sighs> okay. And the top movie. <laughs> I feel embarrassed. <laughs> you should. <laughs> <laughs> the top movie uh, was, uh, speaking of hanging by our fingertips to our dignity, the top movie Cliffhanger. was Cliffhanger. Yes, Indeed. The Lone's Finest. Which took in $20 million this week. The New York Times headline, interestingly, was Eastward Ho, The Great Move Reverses. As, uh, I guess, demographically, we were moving back east. We mm. went out west and we're like, no, it's hot and dry and awful out there. Let's come back, come back to the east. Uh, yeah. So you know, fair enough. I I never uh, I never left. So we're east coasters all the way. Although uh, the west is astonishingly beautiful. My brother was getting ready for his junior prom, his junior high school prom, which I remember because he took this like really cool. Uh, you know, his senior prom, he took his girlfriend Liz at the time. This he took this girl Tina, who was really cool. Uh, and I remember being really excited to take the pictures. That was my first prom experience, even though I was 13 years old. So, Oh, I was going to my seventh grade dance Ooh. Uh, and in the uh, in the gym at the Browns River Middle School. Um, this was not the eighth grade dance where my heart was broken uh, mm. by by a certain lady who I um, got. I, I, I worked up the courage. I worked it up for so long. And this one was in the cafeteria. It wasn't even in the gym. It was the eighth grade dance. Like, this is it. This is the last hurrah of eighth grade of middle school. I'm going to do it. And I went up and I said, hey, will you dance with me? She's like, no. End of conversation. So I bet you many relationships in the future for future Keith would have been much easier. Are also going to begin been that, that way? No, if it just been more upfront, <laughs> don't, don't tease it out for years. I will also getting you get used to no. Yeah. But now, as a as an older person, I appreciate it. So yeah, man. Just there tell me it what's is. Up. Just tell me what's up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Just be clear. So uh, this episode was directed by Cliff Bowl, who is this is the first time on Deep Space Nine, but is a veteran Star Trek director. He did seven episodes of Deep Space Nine. 25 episodes of The Next Generation and 10 episodes of Star Trek Voyager. So uh, he's done a lot of Trek. This episode was written by Joe Minoski with a story editor teleplay and or he he was the story editor teleplay uh, writer and, and uh, wrote the story on 33 episodes of The Next Generation and four episodes of Deep Space Nine, 36 episodes of Voyager, and then... Rising like a phoenix, uh, doing one episode of Disco. Okay. So, uh, Joe Manoski, another very, uh, very experienced Star Trek folks working on this episode. And uh, you think, hey, we let's talk about the episode. But no, we have my favorite segment about... Now Keith, waste your time with Trivial Trivia. Okay, so this is the most trivial of trivia this week, uh, which is my favorite. The star date of this episode actually places the events in this episode before that of the Forsaken. So we have a weird time traveling thing going on here. So uh, Odo's elevator encounter has not happened yet in this episode. So I'm wondering, probably, I mean, it's possible they filmed it and, and, uh, released them out of order, Mm -hmm. but also it's very possible that it's just a bunch of random numbers and nobody bothered to check. Uh, but it is interesting. Um, cause I don't think there's anything canonically that would affect either one of those. I think it's merely just, you know, the star date numbers at the beginning of the episode and and they didn't have an intern double check it, but yeah, I feel like I feel like you want your series of television to be like, at least in your brain when discussing them, have to be canonical. Unless it's clearly a flash, I mean, like a flashback. Well, well no, of course. But I, yeah, I 
Somebody smarter than me, somebody who knows more than me, which is anybody who was listening to this, uh, probably knows the answer to that. And leave a comment below. And uh, do you know if they just filmed this out of order or if that was just a mistake? Yes, that's good for so the, the podcast. But the newbie is the one telling you, for story's sake, it's mm -hmm. sequential. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Okay, so uh, the clock that Cisco builds in this episode is seen in the background of his office for the rest of the series. Oh, I'm glad that play, that pays forward because that makes it mean something. Yeah, well, at least it's I, I, the attention to detail, adding the little props that come up in Cisco's office, I think is really smart. Yes. So we now have two pieces of uh, props that are going to be with us forever. We have the baseball, and mm -hmm. now we have the clock. So Because uh, I was Cisco, OCDing the whole episode trying to figure out what that meant, what that clock symbolized. And I... I came up with Bubkiss, Keith. <laughs> so, so possibly symbolizing the time we wasted on this episode? Who knows? But... Yeah, we'll talk about it. <laughs> All right. So uh, in the airlock scene, at the very end, you can see Cisco's comm badge, despite them having taken it off earlier. Oh. This is an actual mistake because they had to reshoot the scene and uh, completely forgot about it. So uh, that is definitely... Just a uh, just a mistake. And uh, this last one, I think, is particularly fun and interesting, although it probably wasn't fun for a Nana Visitor. So during the filming of this episode, Nana Visitor slipped on a wet stairway and injured her back. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Nana. She, of course, being a trooper and playing Kira, wanted to finish her scenes. Um, but uh, Rick Berman, the producer, made her go to the hospital. Um so she, she, she's like a wrestler, man. She wants to finish the match. She's not going home early. Uh, but when she got to the hospital, still in makeup, the doctors ignored her back and were trying to fix her horribly broken nose. Oh, no. But because it, it's, it's Bajoran. It was makeup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's yeah. funny. <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to get the screenshots ready. Mm, I couldn't, I didn't, it wasn't a good sell well, job by me. Welcome to the show, Mike. <laughs> yeah, thanks. It's very early for us. It's very early for us. Uh, but I thought that there's there's actually several stories about, um, you know, cast members in Star Trek having to go out into the public in their makeup, whether, you know, it's, it's L.A., so there's like an earthquake or they, there's an injury or whatever, and people reacting to them in their uh, Star Trek makeup. It's good fun. I, it reminds me of high school. Right. Because well, does, if does you it? remember, you did your well, you you did your high school musical, right? And, I, did one. Uh, I did one, but I'll I'll count it. You only did one. That's I did right. one my you senior year. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but one of the one of the the tropes of, of high school or community theater is you freeze. There yeah. you go. Sorry, I don't know why that. Um, but one of the one of the things about it is that a you wear way too much makeup. Yes. And in in professional theater, I don't think I've worn non like storytelling makeup. Like I need a wound or something. In like forever, uh, but in community theater in high school, they just cake that on. Well, that's you because you you haven't done many shows as an old guy, Keith. Because you start to at least pull out the uh, the under eye cover up, the concealer. <laughs> it's it, it becomes a staple of your bag. It used to be for me, like you said, because I'm kind of a, a Mediterranean skin. I would just I'd throw in some lip balm. I'd get some like uh, cherry chapstick. That would be my uh, freaking mm -hmm. professional makeup kit. And then things have changed lately. Some just for men and some under eye concealer are part of my gig bag. That is because you have not embraced your oldness. The characters I play now are like, you know, old and broken and messed up in some fashion. Or they're going through it usually. Okay, so yeah. uh, it's fine. This this can live. Anyway, uh, so of course it's community theater. It's high school. You're just like putting on makeup because it's like it feels cool. And specials, you're putting on way too much, and you never take it off because, of course, you're going. You, you have to go to to Hojo's or Applebee's or, uh, for me, it was Friendlies after yep. the show in ben, full we were, makeup. We were big Bennigans people. Bennigans, yeah. Uh, so that I mean, that was always like what you did is you you had to go out to dinner with all of your makeup, and that was part of like, oh, are you in a show? Yes, I am. I'm doing Grease at. My high school production. I'm playing Chubby Kanicki. <laughs> that, was, that was, you know, that was a big point. Why is Kanicki wearing uh, under eye makeup? 
uh, don't worry about it. It's theater. This is what we do in the theater. This is how we create our dramatis personae. Kenicky? Do you mean ten cookie? <laughs> no. You know, you know what it was? Uh, it wasn't Kenicky or Ten Cookie. It was no nookie. <laughs> this is terrible. <laughs> Let's summer move forward. no lovin'. Okay, let's summer move. no lovin'. Summer <laughs> definitely no lovin'. Tell me about so it, Pudge. Okay, that's terrible. <laughs> let's just move forward. Tell me about it, turtleneck, for no reason. <laughs> we Tucked said the show was jeans. gonna be different. We said this show was gonna be different. What were we thinking? Mock turtleneck tucked into your mom jeans. No, literally, they belong to your mom. <laughs> they probably do. Okay. Oh, my God. All right. Hold up. Focus, focus. All right. So our guest stars this week include Tom Tolls as Han Teal, who he also got, played- A lot of screen time for, for him. A lot, of, a lot of screen time. Who also played Dr. Vatim in Voyager episode Rise. You have Stephen Parr as the Valerian captain, Randy Flug as the guard, and Jeff Pruitt- as the uh, ensign, the Bajoran ensign, who did frequent stunt work on Trek, we including in Battle Lines. So as already uh, gone from a stunt performer, and they gave him a line in this episode, which is uh, which is great. So uh, let's move forward and hop into our screening room with everybody's favorite bumper, Michael. Michael, there we go. <laughs> the tag is okay. one of the best parts. Yeah. It really is. Uh, it's just. It just keeps going. It just sort of spins out into the universe. All right. So we begin this episode in the teaser. And uh, Cisco is standing and reading his iPad in front of the computer, as one does. So I, I frequently will stand, read my iPad in front of my computer, and just like that's how I'm existing in my day. But that's what Cisco does. Uh, when Kira enters and says that there's a Valerian ship asking to dock, they used to run weapons grade dolomite. The dolomite is my name. To the Cardassians in I'm the so occupation. I'm so glad because I did that myself every time on the show last night. <laughs> on Mike Watch, I was like, Dolomite! <laughs> so, We're going to so, be real uh, careful with that. <laughs> real careful, real short, real short. <laughs> uh, they used to run, like I said, she said, they used to run weapons grade Dolomite to the Cardassians in the occupation. So she's like, screw those guys. Cisco says they need proof before they can intervene. Of course, he's a Federation officer. He sends, he sends Kira to the task of finding the evidence, but will allow them to dock. So uh, we head to Ops, and Dax and O'Brien have a couple of explaining why Keiko isn't in the episode, which is, is interesting because, like, Keiko's own, not in a tremendous amount of episodes, but she gets a lot of references because I think when you need to begin a scene in media res, mm -hmm. usually you're talking like, hey, what's going on with your wife? What's going on with your whatever? So uh, anyway, she's taking kids to, uh, to Bajor for a school field trip and they sound bored. Then it's like when you know somebody, I, I gotta tell you this quickly. So we were on the cruise. I was on a cruise gig and, uh, we met some people and we were hanging out with them a lot. Uh, they were just like, I can't remember the other performers or whatever. Long story short, at, like in middle of uh, dinner one night, um, the one guy, younger guy, is like starts talking about his wife. And we were like, oh, you're married? Like you've, up to this point, never mentioned your wife, which. Mm. Mm. Well, was he working on the cruise or was he going on a cruise without his wife? Uh, he was working. So. Uh, oh okay. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. point being, I think so he, he somebody in the, he somebody in the writing room was like, "We got to remind everybody that O'Brien's married because, like, we don't want Dax to get any ideas." Oh, uh, well, fair enough. Fair enough. 
Uh, so then something comes through the wormhole. Oh no, it's a Klingon ship. And they are back early, but uh, they forgot to not explode in a ball of fire. So boom, Klingon ship comes through, blows up. But before it blows up, a Klingon beams onto Ops. Hold on, He's real been quick. Yeah. Keith, if I ever blow up, please have mm-hmm. a reaction that's slightly more exaggerated than this. <laughs> He's like, oh, it blew up. <laughs> he looks concerned. This is mildly concerned. I mean, I, I, I would definitely have a mildly, if you pulled into my driveway and your car blew up, I'd be like, hmm. <laughs> Did any of that car uh, shrapnel hit my garage? Uh, oh, yeah, what's boy, this, yeah. Keith? Oh, 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 uh, because a Klingon beams onto Ops. He's been shot, and he says, make me live. No, no, no. He says, victory. Then he drops dead. Oops. And that is our teaser. Now, clearly this time, so uh, they did. A, they made a lot of effort this time because his beamer didn't quite work, so they did a rebeam and, like, grabbed him, mm-hmm. right? And so now that a Klingon dramatically dies, Ben's going to have a bigger reaction than he did to the the ship blowing up, right? Clearly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, well, well, yeah, just watch a, a man die in front of him. Ben, what say you? Oh, wait, let's get the big line. That's just, <laughs> this guy's one line, so let's relive it. Victory. Q, Ben. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> Ben's face, the, every face Ben makes. Oh, uh, yeah. This episode makes me filled with glee. That is the face that you make when you go to your Holiday Inn snack bar and they're like, they're out of bacon. If that is a specific reference, Keith, I was going to say it's more like a, someone's going to have to clean this shit up. <laughs> that too. Roll credits. Okay. So we roll credits and we begin act one. They identify the Klingon. He was the first officer of the ship. And uh, he got killed in a ton of ways. He got stabbed and phasered and who knows. Uh, and the ship was only going to the uh, other quadrant to do a biosurvey. And it shouldn't have been that stabby of a mission. Um, so here's a question for you, Mike. What, going into this, not having seen much of Star Trek, do you know what the relationship is between the Klingons and the Federation at this point? Uh, no, not in like sort of the grand scheme of things. I but I did get context from sort of Ben's reaction that they don't the cling we don't trust Klingons and they're a little uh, apparently there's a there's some ac- acrimony. Uh, but they're not actively at war as they yeah, have that, been. That, yeah, that made sense. So they're they're allies, but you know they're Klingons. Okay, fair enough. So uh, we find uh, D- Dax is super distracted, and she finds all of this hilarious. Then. The uh, Valerian ship shows up, and Kira tries to delay them. And Cisco tells her once again that she has to let them dock. And she pissed. She's pissed. She's pissed. Well, you know, they uh, do. You, do you know what you know what they've been selling, Mike? The Dolomite is my name. Yeah, they've been selling uh, selling Dolomite. So we that's not. They good. say it a lot this episode too. It's like somebody was like, "That sounds great. Let's just say it a lot." <laughs> Although, if you check the uh, closed captions, uh, this will not stop me from rolling that a bunch of times more, uh, but the, it's actually I-D-E. dolomide, yeah. I-D-E, dolomide. Uh, but yeah, no, it's hard not to, uh, it's hard to get that out of your head. So uh, in Quark's, Odo and Quark, or uh, Quark complains to Odo about the Klingons. They're very hard on the hollow sweets because their sex is energetic, let's say. Uh, but uh, they do pay good money for what they do to the uh, Hollow Suites. Uh, they're also bragging a lot about the glory of their bio survey mission. So we're getting a little backstory. So the, clearly the Klingon ship docked at Deep Space Nine before. And uh, they were very excited about their uh, bio survey mission, which is odd because it, bas- it seems like they went out, they went through the wormhole to do their biosurvey mission. Then they came back to Deep Space Nine to brag about it. And then they went back to the wormhole. 
and and had all of this. It's very confusing. But uh, Odo, of course, wants to know, you know, more about what's going on. Quark wants to trade him something for the info, and Odo just extorts him by threatening to take the maintenance crew off of repairing the hollow suite. Uh, you know, it's it's if I were Quark, Odo would, like extorts him like three times an episode. I feel like I would be uh, I'd be a little salty about that. I get it. Uh, but Quark says the Klingons thought they were going to bring back some sort of weapon that will make them wildly powerful in the universe. Uh, so uh, they, did you everybody have Everybody talks too loud at Quark's. Everybody, yeah, everybody's screwed. Well, I mean, do you have to look at those ears, man? Yeah, that's a good point. Well said. I would hey, imagine just for sex got- touching. No, they're, they're not just ear balls. They're ear ears. So... <laughs> Put up, put wrap it, trademark it. That's ours. <laughs> they're not just ear balls, they're also ear ears. Get your t shirts at patreon.com slash yeah. KN. <laughs> uh, so then Odo freaks out. Uh, then he passes out. His face does a weird flip floppy thing. There it is. Uh, that's a sort of a cool effect. Yeah, it's really cool. If you've ever played, uh, for my gamers out there, if you've ever played The Last of Us, oh. On PlayStation, he looks like a he absolutely looks like a clicker. That's what a clicker looks like. Is that that that's the the zombie game, right? Oh, is, that is, is that, yes, is, that's that's that the cooperative I, one where you can play like sp- split screen. No, no. so th- 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 it is uh, the pejorative would be it's a zombie game. But some would also say it's one of the two greatest games ever made of all time. So, really, narrative adventures, yes. Oh, I, I haven't played it. Maybe I'll play oh, it. Oh yeah, you need to play the first one. They're re- yes. You don't have a PlayStation, huh? so you, you can't. I don't. I'm an Xbox guy. You might want to watch just to, it's it's the game is great. I'm not really into like survival horror particularly, but mm-hmm. the story, the narrative is one of the best novels I've ever read. Both both versions, both games. So it might be even worth just like a put it on in the background, just like watch a stream of it, of the game of of a playthrough. I'm too old to watch other people play video games. No, oh, Keith. That's, I got it out that's... of my system in the basement watching my older brother play the like original first Tomb Raider on the first PlayStation mm-hmm. for yeah, hours watching and him hours play. and hours. I'm sure you weren't just staring at the polygons. All right, let's move. So Clark, Clark uh, Odo's head blows up. <laughs> Odo's head blows up, and Quark <laughs> runs for help in in like a little beat, which I think is cool. You Dr. see Bashir. that that Quark is genuinely concerned for his BFF. Uh, yeah, it's cool. Which is, yeah, we, we, we see a little break in the uh, in the tete-a-tete, and we see that Quark is genuinely concerned. So uh, we begin Act 2 in the infirmary. And after all of that drama, eh, oh, it was fine. And, well, uh, first he gets a laser beam shined on his neck. He does get a laser beam. He gets the uh, laser fine. pointer on his neck. The cat runs after it. Uh... But but basically, he asks Odo how he feels because Bashir knows nothing about Odo's physiology, so he's useless. Uh, Bashir then asks Odo if he's concerned about the Valerian situation. He hints that there's going to be trouble between Cisco and Kira, and he's looking very shifty. Mm-hmm. Uh, then uh, Kira goes to Cisco's office. And he's acting all weird and paranoid too. And they uh, they argue about what to do about the Valerians, and Cisco is all scary. So what are you thinking here at this? I, I always ask you like at exactly this moment in the plot, like where where's Mike's head at this point? Well, uh, a little blown up like Odo's. So first, I started like doing like a spec script, and I'm like, okay, this is cool. Clearly, when the Guy beamed on. Maybe he brought something with him, or they were looking for a weapon. So maybe that weapon, like maybe they secretly beamed him in to like get the weapon to use the weapon. Mm-hmm. And Odo is now like because Odo was a little strange in his when he came to too. He, at this point in the episode, you couldn't tell if Bashir was just being really weird or if Bashir was testing Odo to see if because I thought maybe they'd give since Julian's kind of they were kind of last episode we gave him more agency and a little he's a little more. Uh, hero julian i thought maybe he hasn't happened yet happens next week yeah i thought maybe he sniffed something out and was like doing sort of like 
a test to see if it was really the real Odo still, or if he, they'd if they'd my, body snatched him. That's uh-huh. where my brain was. This scene then threw my theory, the direct next scene threw my theory out the window, and I'm like, okay, they're both being weird. Who's I? I, I will say that the writing at least obfuscates the already obfuscated plot a little bit successfully here because I'm doing the I'm trying to do the detective work as to who's affected, right? Like who is mm. the one. Uh, but you know, and then it turns out it's it's everybody. But uh, okay, let's let's move on. Yeah. So uh, on the runabout, O'Brien and Dax are surveying the wreckage. O'Brien starts asking about Kira's motivations. Mm. They're all paranoid and weird too. And O'Brien is clearly on Team Cisco, and Dax is still kind of just flighty. Yeah. Then O'Brien finds the black box. And, uh, yeah, so we continue the sort of what's going on here. Um, uh-huh. I, you know, it, it, I, it, it's funny because, like, you feel like it's going to add up to more than it is. And at this point, I don't know what the stakes are. I don't know what we're supposed to care about. And there's, I, I and, and there's a stunning lack of consistency. Not stunning. That's aggressive. There's a lack of consistency between, like, okay, there's a couple people who are, like, plotty. But then there's there's uh, Dax who's just like kind of flighty. But then uh, but then Cisco becomes that way. He's sort of like he's the least consistent because it's like when he's in I'm building my clock zone. He's he doesn't give two craps. But then he's really into it's it's weird. I'm I'm it overanalyzing all, because it doesn't deserve it. It's yeah. It's kind of it's it's all kind of a mess. Um. So then uh, Kira visits Odo to try and get him on her side. She's convinced that the Valerians have the Dolomite. The Dolomite is my name. And she asks Odo to sneak aboard and find out. She lies and says that Cisco said it was okay. Odo calls her on it, and she asks him which side he's on and vaguely threatens him. Uh, okay? Mm-hmm. We're... So we're about to start Act Three, and I have no idea what's going on, and yes. I'm not sure that I. And they're right there with you, buddy, or not there with you. Um, so Act Three begins. O'Brien does a personal log. They've discovered a piece of the captain's log from the Klingon ship, and the VHS tracking is off, so it's hard to make out. Uh, kids, VHS tapes, you have to adjust the tracking, mm-hmm. and it looked like looked just like that, even though it was clearly a digital signal. Yeah, we see a good. lot of. Uh, of analog tracking issues on Star Trek. Uh, so Cisco doesn't care and doesn't want to be bothered. Dax is all wistful, and Odo is like WTF. And I, Odo is speaking for all of us. Um, but Keith, so, clearly Mike's yeah. figured it out at this point because there's a subliminal message hidden in the message that is making them all go. It's like a, it's like a hit. It, it's 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 not science fiction. It's old school. It's analog, if you will. It's mm. <clears throat> it's hypnotizing them. That's what it is. Mike figured it out. People oh, okay. Yeah. Well, it's not necessarily wrong. It's kind of true. Yeah, but it's not my thing. Look, which is like we weren't able to detect it because it's so old. Subliminal. It's old school. Yeah, it's in the VHS. Ah, there it is. There it is. Um, that yeah. would have made some sense. Yeah. If there was a purpose to any of it. Anyway, in <laughs> Quark's... Ben's like, I'm out. I'm out. Peace out. I got to make a clock. Uh, so in Quark's, Dax gets a fancy drink when uh, Kira shows up and tells Quark to get lost. Kira then flirts with Dax and tries to get her on Kira's side. Then she steals her drink. Not cool. No. Right? Uh, I, I, I have to, I have to admit this and, you know, back in the day I had to like admit this on like the first date because like most, you know, you get to a certain age, you have your first date and the first conversation is like, do you want kids or not? Because otherwise we're wasting our time. And I'm like, I don't share food. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not a good share. Jen's really good at it, but I'm not good at it. I'm not, I'm not a good share. Don't, don't take, don't take my drink. Although to be fair, Kara did top off the drink. So she didn't. She did replace what she took, but uh, nah, that's that's not cool. Uh, but meanwhile, Dax is lost in nostalgia. She can't focus. And uh, Kira says she's getting rid of Cisco one way or the other. And then we find out that Quark has been listening, of course, and Kira attacks him, of course. 
So uh, does she Superman punch him like Eleanor in the practice? She sure does. Uh, deep cut for the two yeah. people who cross <laughs> over for both of our shows. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so Quark arrives. I mean, it's Odo's. the same beat, Keith. It, it is, is the, the big, exact the same neck beat. brace. Yeah. Maybe David E. Kelly stole it from this episode. This episode aired almost ten years before. You could that make one. that argument. Okay. It's it's possible. It's a pretty silly Star Trek neck brace. Um, did like Bashir give him that, or did he have like? Does he have like a? So you can basically bring people from the dead with a little red laser, but if you get punched too hard, you gotta still wear that 1993 neck brace. No, but I think that that was. I think this was Quark, Quark yeah. playing. Yeah, no, I, I I think Quark has a uh, has a suitcase full of neck braces and arm braces and such for the lawsuits. Um, but uh, it goes to Quark to uh, file challenge uh, charges, and he tells them that Kira has been plotting. This is when Odo finally puts it together that folks are acting weird and heads to investigate. So our our incredibly talented investigator is just now thinking, huh, something seems weird. Uh, but we don't know why or what or what the stakes are, what anybody's objectives are. They're just acting weird with no purpose. Uh, Uh-oh, Frizo. Ooh, we're frozen again. We're back. We're, oh, we're almost back. Oh. Oh, all kinds there. of weird shit is happening. <laughs> all kinds of weird crap Another dead-eyed picture of Mike's living Oof. room. Oh, man, she, the computer's is. like, put me to bed for a month. <laughs> so, uh, Odo finds Dax watching the Klingon log over and over. And O'Brien's Keith, wait, insist- want, you want a deep cut? I got a deep cut. I don't know why I couldn't get this out of my head. But for some reason, c- crazy Vulcan, not Vulcan, crazy Klingon through VHS bad tracking reminded me, and I could not, uh, I couldn't believe that, that this my ner- this neuron fired. It reminded me of this weird oh. character on Zubilee Zoo. Did, oh, you, did you ever wow. watch Zubilee Zoo? I did not watch Zubilee. Is that Ben Vereen? That is Ben Vereen. He was the lead of of uh, Zubilee Zoo. Let me make it a little <laughs> larger for you. But this like weird fox character. If, if Zubilee Zoo was like this fever dream combination of like. Cats and Starlight yeah, it's Express. Mr. It's yeah. very, it's very. But this, this guy was like the mayor of the town, like Mayor Fox, I think was his name. I don't know how any of I remember any of this. And <laughs> if you really oh. think about it, <laughs> so uh, folks, if you ever wake up the next morning from your nightmare and wondering where did, how did that get into my head? This is the my next nightmare. But Whatever the. Somehow that stuck in my brain for years uh-huh. and years and wasn't resurrected. Never thought of again until this That's, guy. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, we're we're learning things about Mike. That's really what we're here for. Yeah. We're here to learn more things about Mike. It reminds <laughs> me, though, of uh, I had the VCR, the Star Trek The Next Generation VCR game where Gowron steals the Enterprise on VHS. Uh, and that's what it reminded me of. Uh, so, uh, Odo overhears the Klingon log. Mr. Fox says that they opened an energy sphere and there was a coup on the ship. Then Odo goes to Cisco's quarters and there are two guards standing outside. Oh, right. We say O'Brien's in Cisco's office, also watching the log. Uh, I am the gatekeeper. I am the gatekeeper. Are you the key master? Uh... So Odo goes in and finds Cisco playing on an etch sketch. Because uh, that's that's what he does now. Yeah, basically. Uh, and Odo tries to explain what's happening to Cisco, but it turns out it's a clock he's working on like a madman. I'm sure there'll be a reason for this. Eh, but there I don't know if there is that, but there is a commercial break, which brings <laughs> us to Act Four. This is yeah, the there. best. <laughs> It's a clock. It's a clock. It's, the Avery a, Brooks line reads are back in full effect this episode. You know, this was a, a bottle episode again to save money because they were clearly like out of cash by cash, this point. Yeah. They they had no money left. Uh, but it's amazing that they were able to save money on this episode considering they had to rebuild the entire set 
after Avery Brooks chewed it into pieces. Like, that have to replace the entire set. It seems very expensive. So, uh, in Act 4, Odo returns to his office to find sexy Kira lounging on his chair. She says she locked the Valerians down, and she admits that she's going after Sisko and O'Brien. She offers Odo more authority and, the po- and power in exchange for his loyalty. Do you want to murder Quark? I won't ask any questions. No. Go to town. Which... Just huff you know, that dolo mide. <laughs> exactly. So uh, it, it is an interesting play that she knows that what Odo would like is just no regulations. He, he Basically, she's like, I'm offering you the opportunity to become Dick Cheney. Yeah. And mm. just just go nuts. So Keeps um, political twist. Woo, woo. <laughs> 20 years old, but it's still on <laughs> my tip of my tongue. <laughs> Uh, now so we Odo watch asks, the Klingon on even small in an all even smaller screen. Yeah, but they fixed the tracking. That's good. Obviously. Uh, so he asks Kara what the plan is. He's good at playing along, but she won't tell him. He tries to uh, so Odo tries to reach the Federation, and then Bajor. But communications have been blocked by either side. So the. Uh, the, the clearly we've broken into factions. We're having a little power struggle between Kira's side and Cisco's side. Uh, so Odo decides just to keep watching the Klingon journals. He finds out more about the energy sphere, which held a telepathic archive about a power struggle that destroyed their culture. Mike, were um, you following all of this? So there was a struggle of a different species that got somehow saved into some memory tubes, memory spheres. A telepathic archive, yes. Archives, which then were taken by the Klingons because they thought they were this weapon? Yes. But then it, like, clearly, like, screwed with them, we, it seems, and then it came, it got to us. Okay, okay, well, yeah, sure. I know about as yeah. much as makes needs so, to be known. So for, for some reason... This culture that got torn apart and destroyed by this power struggle, this mutiny, decided yeah. decided to save it in this little energy sphere as a telepathic archive to make anybody who stumbles across it reenact their power struggle and destroy themselves. Well, it is sort of like a level up from our um, what do we call them time capsules. Like, oh my god. We've dug up a seven, uh, an eighteenth century time capsule of what daily life was like. If we opened it, what if we opened it up and it like made us reenact the civil or the uh, the revolution? We're just like Arr, muskets. <laughs> that, I mean, that level up, baby. But but that's it. I mean, that's it's. You know, I get it if it's like smallpox or something. Like, oh, there's a disease that we we'd eradicated and now it's back or whatever. Like, but like a telepathic reenactment. So like, Yo, everyone that's has a grudge, man. That's a crud. It's like, oh, I hate, I hate uh, Keith so much that the technology has advanced that when I'm gone, I'm going to bottle my hatred mm-hmm, and make mm-hmm. someone else continue to feel it because I will not let it go. That is a grudge. If you, that is a commitment to a grudge, baby. It's an amazing grudge, except for it. It's not one side because, like, you know, the two people open it. One of them hates me, but one of them hates you. Yeah, there's like a so, there's a there's a cast sheet in there. It's like okay, we need there are two I, antagonists. I think, I think that's there's exactly one plotter. it. Yeah, it's basically just like somebody like I wrote this really great play. I'm gonna force everyone to do a community theater version of my play every time they open this thing, because that's kind of what happens. Uh, where am I? Oh yeah, so back in Cisco's, he's finishing the clock as O'Brien talks about what Kira's up to. Cisco says, arrest Kira and all the Bajorans. O'Brien disagrees because they're outnumbered. And he proposes leaving the, the station and bringing back a Federation task force. And Cisco almost chews through the clock with his acting. And he's like, I will stab you with this teeny, teeny, teeny little lance. <laughs> yes, if, I, if you hold still while I stab you for six hours, you'll definitely hurt. But that's not the last time you're going to see a teeny little needle. There's no. one more coming. Hey, so Odo arrives at the infirmary, and uh, Bashir is conspiring with a Bajoran officer, which is the uh, the the 
the stunt guy we were talking about before. So uh, Odo asks about the dead Klingon. There was a telepathic Klingon brain techno babble something something that explains why the Klingons reenacted the power struggle on board. And the same is obviously happening on Deep Space Nine. So then Odo conspires with Bashir on how to counteract the effect. So at least Odo is handling this smartly. Mm -hmm. He's being able to like play both sides. He's able to sort of, you know, read the subtext in the play and figure out how to navigate this. Um, Then on Ops, the Bajoran makes an assassination attempt on Cisco. But uh, don't worry. He Star Trek palm punches the crap out of him. Um, And uh, (laughs) that's a good screenshot. Then uh, Kira arrives with phasers. It is high noon on Ops as we go into the commercial break. Well, don't forget that uh, Dax gets like full on bee slapped by O'Brien. Oh, right. But she's like, I'm thinking about the the good old days. I don't care. He's like, (laughs) she's like, (laughs) it's almost comical. Almost? (laughs) Um, so, uh, Act 5, the standoff continues. O'Brien beams himself and Cisco off of Ops. And oh, there's they're the trying... tiny other needle. Yeah. There's the tiny other needle. Well, I think that was, he was, that was like the, the, some sort of a poison dart it was assassination a ship. It was thing. A sh- totally a mini ship. poison ship. Yeah. Yeah, it's a poison Star Trek ship. Um, so, uh, Cisco and O'Brien are trying to get to the Valerian ship, uh, but they can't. And they call Odo for help. They've they've shut down uh, force fields all over the station so they can't get out. They leave their comm badges and head off for the cargo bay. Back in ops, Kira and Dax realize that Odo is the one removing the force fields. And I like this graphic here where you can see where the force fields are set up and a little mm-hmm. bit of the uh, blueprint of the station. Mind that sweeper, actually baby. really... It totally Minesweeper, but it also, it, it, like, it helps me understand what's happening with the force fields when they don't have the uh, budget to do the force field effects and delete them in a way that we can see because we are out of money. money. <laughs> um, so back on Ops, Kira and Dax realize it's Odo removing the force fields. They call him, and he says he's trapping them in the cargo bay. Odo playing both sides. hmm and uh, Bashir is going to techno babble, get rid of the telepathic effects in the cargo bay. And Odo works to trap all of our heroes there. So Kira shows up and they're all there. Blah, blah. They have an argument. And Avery Brooks is all caps going for it. Uh, then Odo arrives and zaps out all the wait, telepathic but bad he, guys. How does he oh, do wait. it, Keith? He calls on the best super secret name of a super secret fix everybody program ever made. Computer run program Odo One. Odo One. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yes. Oh, they, yes. Didn't, they didn't even try to make it a super secret name. It's just called Odo One. It's like when your password is just Keith. <laughs> <laughs> the password, yes, yes. It's just Keith's password. Yeah. One uh, exclamation point. <laughs> Actually, no, Keith and I, I will say this, all of our passwords for our, like, uh, business stuff. All of stuff, our empire. Yeah, yeah is uh, really childish. <laughs> so childish. We just changed every few days making just fun of the other person. the other it's one off. Great. That's yeah, right. Awesome. That's right. That's right. Just uh, trolling each other. So... <laughs> no! uh, so they, uh, they zap out the telepathic bad guys. Yay. Uh... Beam them out with a little. <laughs> I don't know what. It, what is this supposed to be? Uh, they, uh, yeah. So they they zap it out. Everybody's sane again, but they've got to get rid of the purple mist. Oh yeah. Let's see if only if there was an airlock nearby. So they open the airlock and aliens the mist out into space. Gotta hold on though, and... Keith. Hold on. Uh huh. Uh huh. Oh. Everybody hold on while our hair blows in the wrong direction. As opposed to being sucked out to space, they have like one fan going this way and one fan going that way. <laughs> it's a lot, lot of air movement happening. Even, even <laughs> Odo's hair got a little, look at that. Even that hair gel couldn't hold it down. Oh, and that's some pretty serious hair gel. 
This goo, see, because he's made out of goo. So, yeah, so, uh, yeah, they saved the day. They zapped out the telepathic mist, and Cisco and Kira have a chat afterwards. Kira apologizes for the mutiny, and uh, Cisco checks out his fancy ass clock, uh, which is a really cool looking whatever that is. Yeah, very cool. Very cool. It's an awesome prop. I mean, I'm sure it's like a real thing, but uh, yeah, so, it, and, and of course, like, Kira apologizes for the mutiny, which of course she had absolutely no control over. And Cisco's like, oh, let it slide this time. Never mind the fact that I tried to beam you into space or something. <laughs> it was like, yeah, it's, it's just like, well, I guess we're not ever, we, we, there's no consequences. Well, they're, I mean, they weren't themselves. So, well, there shouldn't be consequences because they were doing a play, right? Mm-hmm. So she shouldn't have had to apologize to him. And he, he should have been like, hey, you were zapped by a telepathic I mean, should we alien. do some, should no. we do some, should we go, should we maybe just like, have, should we have captured that or should we have not just like released into space to hurt other people? Should we have, should we have done something a little better? Well, we go they, back and get they it? say, they say it dispersed. Oh, it's done. It's good. Okay. It's, it's cool. just like, uh, oh, without I, its I energy guess. tube, it can't. Okay. They just threw it into the ocean. Um, no resolution to the dolomite, right? We're just going to let that, that's just going to let that slide too. I, it, I, you know what? It's time for Mike and Deglio's Star Trek Vocabulary Quiz. Okay, your first word is, Mike, what is a telepathic field? So, Keith, did you ever see the movie The Ring? I love The Ring. Yeah, so you know how they were able to, like, beam some sort of demon horror into a VHS tape? Uh Uh-huh. Well, that's like this, but like instead of a VHS tape, it's like a Klingon message. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, sorta. And uh, your next question, we're gonna have to change the music for this. Uh, Mike, what is Dolomite? It's something that pisses Kira off, and it was like a spice trade that used to be in her war that like really pissed her off. And they're like maybe running it again, and she's like, "That's not cool." And he's like, "And and Ben's like, you gotta let it go." But then later she's like, "I'm infected with some stuff, so I wanna now be a mutiny." But guess what? It's hard to be pissed when you're dancing like this. <laughs> yeah, well, you gotta I, cut that's... it now. You gotta cut it. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, ba- yeah. Basically, it's it's a some version of plutonium. Yeah, uh, sure. uranium or something. So uh, some would call it a, just MacGuffin of MacGuffins. Somebody would say, "I could go for a MacGuffin right now." Yeah, mm, we're I'm getting there close. We're close. Okay. Well then, uh, yeah, congratulations on that. What do you say we come along home, Mike? Yeah. You're an okay. insane person, Keith. How do you sing like that? Okay. <laughs> oh, my poor neighbors. It's uh, cause they my neighbors never get to hear the arrangements or the other uh, harmonies. It's just one <laughs> random dude screlting in his times. basement. <laughs> oh, thank God I don't uh, live in, in an apartment anymore. All right, so uh, Mike, I don't think I'm. The question is not, were there wormholes in the plot? Was there anything other than wormholes in the plot? Yeah, I mean, it, it's funny because a wormhole sort of, it, it sort of indicates that it, it, the pieces don't match up. The problem with this episode is that there are just all pieces, right? That's, it's, it's like when you're trying to fit things together, you need to know what, it's like, okay, let's use the clock analogy that Ben's building. Yeah, perfect. It, it's hard to build a crazy clock if you don't know what the clock's supposed to, if there are A, no instructions, or B, there's no picture that you can recreate. And that's the problem with this episode for me. And I'm gonna just, and this is, we're kind of, we're kind of uh, combining this with the, maybe we should say what we liked first. Maybe we should go backwards this week. Oh, oh, no, I, I, was, I was building a, building a clock out of uh, an action Keith figure, chose, a remote, and some and nut mix. Yeah. And somehow I'm gonna make this into a plot. <laughs> it's not just ear nuts, it's also nut nuts. Okay. Um, nut nuts. Let's go the opposite way because I think it, the wormholes basically talk about our feelings of the episode. So, like, what's something you liked, Keith? Let's start there. 
Um, I liked Odo's being, you know, it, he, he figured it out really slowly. But once he did, his being able to manipulate each of these disparate characters, realizing, okay, Kira's on this side, I know how to manipulate her. Cisco's on this side, I know what he wants. Bashir sort of play in both sides. I know what I know how to play that. And so once Dum Dum Odo becomes not Dum Dum, mm-hmm. I think his his agency throughout this, being able to read the stage directions in the play and figure out people's motivations and and because it's so sort of the play that they're doing is at such a like fifth grade level. He's able to manipulate it really easily, and I'm and that I liked. Yeah, that's cool. Actually, it's really good. My pick is a little more esoteric, if you will. Mm. I like that the cast was willing to trust, for better or for worse, and just go for it. They were like, "There's no model for these characters. It just go for it." And they were yeah. like, "I guess they'll make it. A pl- they'll make the show make sense. Let's go." Like Dax. What do you want me to do? Uh, okay, is there a reason? Like, what am I thinking about? Like, what are the memories? What what is what is distracting me? Eh, don't, don't worry about it. Just just be what distracted. What is the purpose of this yeah. in the plot? Yeah, <laughs> like, but but sh- she was like, all right, cool. And Avery Brooks was just like, so you want me to chew down everything? Absolutely. Therefore, so Colin Meany, old. like his at least was like a little him and and uh, the actress that plays Kira. Uh, Nana Visitor. But Nana, you gotta yeah, learn right, the names, nose. buddy. She, uh, they at least had some sort of like I want in this episode, uh, but outside of that, everybody else was just like, we're just gonna go for it, and then you know. So I like commitment. Uh, I don't know it, that it, it is... paid off for them, but it was it showed trust in the creatives to like make a coherent episode. Mike doesn't know this yet, but we sort of saw proto intendant. Uh, I'm not going to explain any more of that because I don't want to give away any spoilers. But uh, those of you who know, definitely know. And you can 100% see the beginnings of that character. So we're going to do episode rating and wormholes together. (laughs) 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 Um, So here's my big issue, Keith. to to, To play nice to begin. You know, imagine, if you will, watching a biopic, okay? Mm-hmm. but you have no reference point as to who the person is. So let's say you take like a five-year-old, right? And you mm-hmm. show them, this is, and I'm being generous, uh, and you show them uh, Daniel Day-Lewis in Lincoln, okay? Okay, all right. But they have not learned who Abraham Lincoln is yet. So whilst perhaps that five-year-old can appreciate the acting dedication that Daniel Day-Lewis pr- put forth, Having no reference point for who Lincoln was or is, they can't even recognize that they look like that he. Oh, he looks so much like him. Let alone oh, yeah. what a great performance. And so the big thing here is, there might. It sounds like there's sort of an interesting swashbuckling, uh, original tale. Like I don't know the play that they're reenacting. I never saw Pirates of Penzance. So them doing it, I'm losing eighty percent of the magic. Right. That's so smart. That's exactly what's wrong. That and is so, exactly what's wrong. You're right. And it seems like it's an interesting tale. And 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 where I'm disappointed, it's interesting you pointed out Odo being your favorite part. Where I'm disappointed is, and, and I understand why they did this narratively, it's much more interesting. Uh, let me go back to the next generation. The, some of the episodes I've seen that I enjoy are some of the holodeck episodes because they solve the problem, the, 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 the problem of the week, using the fiction that they are in, like Data when he's Sherlock or whatever. They, they use the fiction of that world. Here, I would have much rather seen Odo, and he kind of sort of does it by, by playing both sides, but he doesn't use the initial conflict from the way back to sort of solve the problem in the now. They do a science fiction, beam him into the space lock thing. And so- no, that, that, yeah. no, you're, you're, This is my you're problem. exactly right, yeah. Yes, this is my issue. All the pieces are kind of there for some interesting stuff. We got the actors who are going to be playing parts. Cool. We got this sort of maybe interesting mutiny conflict, which it's very convenient that there happens to be this dolomide thing that makes us in for three seconds in the beginning be like, maybe Kira does have some hairs on her back up, you know? But that kind of gets pushed aside. So those are my issues. And it's just like 
a hot mess because of those. And and so you watch like it feels like this is the conclusion of a three episode arc, and we miss the first two. You know, that's I I think that's that's terrific analysis because I think you put your finger on it. What makes the Sherlock Holmes stuff work is our familiarity with Sherlock Holmes. What makes the uh, even the Dixon Hill Dixon Hill is a fictional character, but we noir. know we know noir. We know the the gumshoe. We know the private detective sort of world, and we know how that architecture works. And uh, and this was a com- all, all of the parts of it were fictional, so we had no reference points. It wasn't like oh they're reenacting Watergate. Fun. Oh, mm-hmm. so he's playing Sparrow Agno and he's playing whatever. Like great, I can sort of follow that and track that, and then Mike know picks what's Lincoln. Happening. Keith picks. Watergate. Watergate. And Spiro uh, you know. Agnew. <laughs> deep cut. Deep cut. <laughs> Odo's John Dean. No. Oh <laughs> so, my God, I love it. Um, but I but I think that that is, I think that's exactly it. We have nothing to hold on to for any of this. We, have, we don't have a purpose. So it, it's obviously there aren't, I mean, are there stakes? Are there not stakes? I don't know. Um, you know, obviously, if they were going to kill each other, those are real stakes, but we don't know why. We don't know what the purpose is. Um, so that's so. If there were real stakes, right? They 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 stepped on this telepathic grenade that causes mm-hmm. you all to kill each other. Whatever. Okay, that's cool. Or if there are not real stakes, but we're going to reenact something fun that we know the story. Just like, oh my god, it's Spider Man! Like, how fun! But if you don't have either, it's just a mess. We have no yeah, idea what what's have? going on. Mm-hmm. We have no idea what's happening. You know, why is why is Dax flighty? What is the purpose of that character? I mean, is is this a story that we're? Is this like some famous tale that they're telling that I'm just not familiar with? Like some obscure Shakespeare reference that we're not getting? I don't know. But if it is, it's too obscure. Yeah. Right. Because uh, you know, I, we certainly it's, it's are, ostensibly mutiny on the bounty, but kind of sort yeah, of. Maybe? I mean, like we're dummies, right? But we know enough of the world and the lexicon of our culture that it should be obvious to us at at least. Um, the what's best going example on. of that, okay? The best example of it is well, I mentioned it before. Is Dax? Like, yeah. okay, the the here are the two that are conspiring, right? We get the like, we got the machinations of the plot. Is that they're trying to overthrow him? They're trying to overthrow him. Here, are the team right. is great. We got it. But like, who's Dax? And then why is Ben? And then there seems to be some nuance, right? Because the the Ben character, whoever he's playing, is really fired up when push comes to shove. But up until that point, he could be he's walking out of the meeting. He leaves when they discover the message. Then he's building the clock, which has no reference point, like unless it's an yeah. Easter egg from some. But from for something the, super for the obscure. episode now, it's like, or they're just like, it's. I don't know if it's if it's weird. referencing something, it is wildly obscure mm-hmm. because you know because even even do like Shakespeare archetypes. All right, so maybe Dax is Falstaff, okay. right? Maybe like. Whatever, maybe maybe the Cisco's Richard the Second, or maybe Kira's Lady McBee, whatever it is. But we don't have that. It's just it's just nonsense. And so you have these, I, yeah. I mean, the the Dax thing, like clearly on this alien planet, one of the leaders was distracted by nostalgia and wasn't able to save it. Okay, sure. But the but I don't thread know who this we're pulling from is. previous Star Trek, you as a writer can. So you here you here are your options. If you're going to do a, a plot like this, either you make the overarching story so specific re just noir film or Sherlock Holmes or right. something everybody or Shakespeare like make them in Shakespearean like hit us over the head with it make it so obvious that we don't have to worry about it it's previous knowledge or you gotta lay the bread crumbs right yeah well and, and but also also even if you're like one of the reasons that you reference something else right is that you have clear intentions yeah and oh, yeah. clear objectives and they didn't really have clear intentions over i mean kira at least had a clear objective right i don't trust the valerians we need to get rid of them cisco's standing in my way to get rid of them so she had a clear intention cisco's no idea and 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 so i mean dax no idea bashir no idea we'd no idea it, it just like 
at least give them clear intentions so that they're, you know, there's also a version of this where it just, it's a, it's like a paranoid bomb, right? That you put out there. And so these actual conflicts, and I think there was actual conflict mm-hmm. between Cisco and Kira get aggravated, you know, which is what I thought at the beginning. I was mm-hmm. like the first time I saw it, Oh, I see. So we're going to take the actual conflict and explode them with this paranoid bomb. And so, and and just take those things to the extreme. But that's not what it was. They were just reenacting other things. Um, uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but not even the, reenacting it. But like, but then was it they're just the intentions that got implanted or was it actual machination? I don't want to, I don't want to like fine tooth comb it because they didn't. But yeah, it's hard it, to it, defend, I would say. I would love people in the comments to defend the episode and defend the, uh, that, you know, tell Keith and I what we missed that would make the key that would make it all click. Or help the it make sense, pendulum please. that will help it tick. <laughs> whatever you want, to, whenever analogy. But for me, Keith, um, the performances are, are have They're trust fun. and bravado and are fun. Um, but, yeah. you know, like if conflict resolution, I guess, is is achieved, all right? So you have you have your t- ticking clock because she could have overthrown the station. Um, right. I think it's clever how Odo figures it out. And I also think it's clever, and the best part of the episode for me, if I had to like put my finger on it, is that they show that scene where his head gets blown up, and so you actually have a reference point for, oh, that's when they tried to implant him because we don't actually see it happen right. to anybody else. At first, I was like, did it happen right. when the beam in came in? And then you don't see them getting attacked separately. Like, you don't, None of right. that is on camera. No, none of, none of it is. And they never actually, like, we're we're inferring that Odo's, like, little attack and his little face blow up was it trying to implant and then couldn't. That's never explained. But I also didn't think that it was, like, a, an organic, a living thing. It seemed like they were archive tubes. So it's well, like, and that's, were and they that's seeking thing. out hosts? Is is it like a, is it a telepathic computer virus? And in your point, like, are they actually reenacting something or are they enacting dynamics? Because they're not saying the the words of the, you know, we're fighting about the Furbies or whatever it was they were fighting about the first time. But also, like, what is the purpose of the telepathic archive? Because is is this working as directed? Or was this a malfunction because, you know, a species came across that the telepathy doesn't work quite right? So there, you know, there there are Star Trek episodes where people come across archives and they re-experience something from a previous culture and to teach them something. But this, like, the outcome of this is, this is like a like a crazy, it is a crazy weapon mm-hmm. because if if left unchecked, this could destroy civilizations. But like, did those people present it as a weapon, or the Klingons just thought heard of it as a weapon? I don't. I, well, it worked as a weapon. It worked yeah. as a weapon, but but, then, it, w- but not a great weapon. Like it, it, most weapons are powerful in their immediacy. This is one where you're like, okay, it's like you shoot the gun, but then you got to wait like a couple months for it to play out. Well, it's like a virus. Yeah, right. Okay. It's it's like a biological biological weapon. weapon. All right, let me let me put it this way. I mean, here's my last yeah. point. Let me put a fine okay. point, a point on it. The worst episodes of this season thus far, and I imagine in the future, the the trope I've noticed, and I'm going to use "Come Along Home" as my example. After some BS happens, right? After some craziness happens, there's mm-hmm, always that mm-hmm. scene at the end where we have the moment where we could, what do we learn this week, right? Did right. Quark learn that he shouldn't he shouldn't gamble with people's lives or that, he, that gaming is different, blah, 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 blah. No, 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 no. We're not going to even mention it. We're just going to say, oh, Quark. That's how we ended that episode. Right, this episode, right, right. well, okay, all this happened. Maybe we should like, maybe we got to be care- more careful about who we beam on. Maybe we got to be... I don't even know how you would make this, what we learn from this, but that's what we could have had in that last scene with with Ben and Kira, or, but or, instead- Or learning to trust each other and our intentions yeah, or something, uh, right. you know, like work sure. out our conflicts. Sure, yeah. But instead it's just like, she's like, so that was effed up. And Ben's like, no, worry about it. Who cares? I got tick, 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 we got a clock. We got a and, clock out of it. And so- that So now we didn't even like, they didn't even attempt to be like, hey, here's the, here's the, the morality story. So listen, the end of the day, it doesn't even meet the threshold for like a coherent episode of television. And so I say no. 42 self-stealing stem bolts. Yeah, no. And and that's it, it's 
it, it, it suffers from everything that you just said there. It also suffers from what, what I'm always complaining about. It's not a Deep Space Nine episode. Like this, you could throw this on any any mm -hmm. episode of any. None of the characters have anything also, to do with the character. Also, when you juxtapose it with last week, I mean, good lord, it's yeah. it's just a mess. Um, and and I think the clock symbolizes the time we've wasted watching <laughs> this episode. Um, you know, and I I get it from the standpoint of like, oh, hey, wouldn't it be fun to like give all of our actors a chance to like play evil versions and paranoid and like play out this this fun thing. And Voyager does a very similar episode, but much more successfully. Um, it, well, we, two weeks ago, we gave them the fun chance to, like, uh, you know, have all their imaginations come true and stuff. We're like, we just did that. Uh, we don't need this. Yeah, it's it's not good. It does it. It doesn't really hold up to any scrutiny. It doesn't make any sense. Um, and uh, yeah, no part of this makes any sense. There isn't enough of a skeleton to hang any of this on. No. To try to make any sense of it. So I think, yeah, it's, yeah, I think this is a, like, select all delete episode. Um, you know, is it as, it's not as bad as the storyteller. And I don't think it's as messy as Move Along Home. I think it's just forgettable. Yeah, okay. I think it's just meh. So uh, you get 38 self sealing stem bolts from me. So um uh, so that is Dramatis Personae. Uh here's the here's here's the here's the fun part. Next week we're doing duet which uh I'm not going to qualify in any way as I as I never do but uh I look forward to talking about it. Uh so right here in your feed next week we will talk about duet uh if you're still here and uh, like hey i, I, I want to support all this you can go to patreon.com slash k and m get all of our bonus content become a producer get thanked on the show and uh other than that leave us a rating leave us a review get your cat to sign up get your parakeet to sign up get your mom to sign up uh till then folks this has been keith and mike watch deep space nine nine Thank you for watching KM Entertainment. If you enjoyed our particular brand of nonsense, please like and subscribe. Or become one of our patrons at patreon.com slash KM.